Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm thrilled to have you joining both Molly Eastman and I here today to talk all about beauty sleep. We're not going to become our most beautiful radiant selves if we're not sleeping great and we don't have the energy required to show up as our best versions. So we're going to get into that topic today. And let me tell you a little bit about Molly. Molly's been on the show before and she's my go-to sleep guru in the space of sleep optimization. So get ready for some incredible tips here. Molly Eastman is the creator of Sleep is a Skill and the host of the Sleep is a Skill podcast. Sleep is a Skill is a company that optimizes people's sleep through a unique blend of technology, accountability, and behavioral change. After navigating insomnia while traveling internationally, she created what she couldn't find, a place to go to learn the skill set of sleep. With a background in behavioral change from the nonverbal group, she became fascinated with chronobiology and its practical application to sleep and her overall experience of life. Knowing the difference between a life with sleep and without, she's now dedicating her life to sharing the forgotten skill set of sleep. In the spirit of that goal, she has created the Number Two Sleep Podcast, written a popular weekly sleep newsletter for over five years, partnered with luxury hotels and lifestyle brands, coached the world's top poker players, and has appeared on over 150 podcasts. And you can learn all about Molly Eastman over at sleepisaskill.com forward slash optimize with something very exciting happening that we're going to be sharing with everybody today. Welcome, 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 Molly. It's great to have you back here on the School of Radiance podcast. How are you today? And then also get ready for the unlimited dollar question. Amazing. Well, I'm so happy to be here. I always love connecting with you. Uh, you always inspire me with your grace and poise. And I'm excited to go in deeper on my favorite topic, sleep. Uh, and looking forward to that million dollar question. If I heard that correctly, that sounds exciting. <laughs> oh, beyond million dollar question, the unlimited dollar question. This is this thing that just seems unattainable for some people. They feel like oh. they don't deserve it. Even I've heard that, believe it or not. Radiance. This is what I love to study. It's deep beauty. It's radiance. It's how we show up. So I would love to hear from you, Molly. When you hear that word radiance, what is radiance to you? And when you engage with people who you consider are a little bit different, shine a little bit brighter, have this je ne sais quoi radiance, what does it look like to you? How would you describe the term radiance? Uh, such a good question. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind for me with radiance, maybe this is my uh, love of alliteration, but radiance and readiness feel uh, connected for me and how befitting with sleep and aura ring and our readiness indicators. Um, but even beyond that, just the ability to be present, dynamically engaged in the world around us. And I think it feels as if it's becoming um, uh, rarer and rarer to see that quality for people. And it would make perfect sense if we're seeing this epidemic of um, certainly, and if you're talking to me, uh, sleep deprivation, if we're seeing epidemics in burnout and loneliness and disconnection and all these things, um, this ability for us to be present and interact with the people around us in a way that is effervescent and alive, it does take a little bit of prepping um, beforehand and kind of systems and workability in your own life. Um, otherwise, it's like a nice idea or short-lived and you might not be able to sustain what it takes to maintain that as kind of a personal value. I love that you mentioned operating systems and our brain is the master control center of our entire body. And the way that we rejuvenate our brain is during sleep. So sleep isn't just to make you feel better, but it's also the way that your brain detoxes. So you will be able to show up better and brighter, the better your brain is functioning. So let's get into some sleep tips here. We are on location in my bedroom to set the <laughs> stage for this beautiful episode. Full transparency is last night, I didn't have the best sleep. I went to bed way too late. I ate a little bit too late. 
And there's some things that we can do if that happens for whatever reason, say you have small kids and you, you were up with them in the middle of the night and all these different things that can happen. We're going to talk about strategies and tips to help you. When you do experience life, we don't always get perfect sleep, uh, but there are some ways to get more perfect sleep more often, which is why we have Molly here. So I'd love to kick things off with that question. Say there's a day where for whatever reason, something interfered with your schedule. I mean, we call this life. How do you support your body on those days when you just know you didn't have the best sleep? So good. Well, one, I'm so glad that you are, as we discussed before we hit record, you know, kind of keeping it real. The importance of this is profound because um, I do see people often when they are delving into this world of sleep optimization, that they might have these unattainable goals of perfection with their sleep. Uh, and it can actually be really problematic and end up um, causing more trouble than it's worth for their sleep. And that's one of the things we see as a bit of a through line for people that tend to trend um, towards insomnia, difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, or just have kind of that uh, a sense that their sleep is not working as well as it could, that trending towards perfection and trying to get it right. So what you're sharing and pointing to of, all right, you know, I didn't have the best sleep. And I know before we hit record, we kind of, um, you were pointing to some of the, this awareness of some of the why it wasn't like a mystery. Um, you're, you know, critically looking at your life and some of the actions, and then you know what those things are. So it's not as much of a, um, you know, question mark for, for many people. Um, I think that's just one important place to begin is to know that these things will happen. It's not like you're broken or a bad sleeper. If you have a rough night, um, and instead what we're training for is resiliency and exactly what you point to do. What do we do to just get ourselves back on track with velocity versus finding ourselves now drifting off for the next week, couple weeks, month of, and now this narrative and story about how our sleep was better and now it's worse and all of that. So what do we do about it? Um, well, one answer that I'm going to share, I'm going to share a couple of things, but one thing might surprise people. And it is actually, um, you can almost think of it as the do nothing method. And this is stick with me here. Uh, so what I mean by this is that one of the things that we very commonly see when people have a rough night of sleep, um, particularly those who, Maybe they got in really late and they, so they didn't get into bed later or they were having trouble falling asleep or they were waking up throughout the course of the night. Some, however they cut it, um, they weren't getting sufficient kind of quality of sleep or length of sleep. Um, and so what we often see is a lot of compensating. So what that can look like is very commonly, and it makes sense on the, when you first look at it, they'll say, all right, my poor body, let me sleep in a little bit to make up for that rough night. So I'm going to sleep in, give my body a little bit of extra rest. So they'll say that, um, they might then compensate with additional stimulants of some type. So lots of coffee, uh, you know, for other people, nootropics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so then the next compensating piece that we see a lot are naps, um, uh, sometimes long naps, sometimes later naps, sometimes frequent naps. Um, and then another really common one is, whoa, last night was rough. I'm going to go to bed super early tonight. Now, all of those things, I don't know about you, but for many people listening, it's like, well, those don't seem that bad. Like, it seems like that would help your poor body and be generous to yourself. And yet one of the things that we see is that each and every one of those can create some havoc on our circadian health. And I know you and I have talked a lot about this and I'm sure you've shared and clear that you've shared a lot with your listeners on this topic. Um, so just to underscore uh, when we're talking about sleep optimization, so sleep wake cycles, it's really important for us to be aware of these clocks in virtually every cell and organ in our body and tissue and skin and outwardly uh, also impacted and have these clocks present as well. So it's important for us to help support keeping these clocks on time. And all of those compensating factors can 
individually, especially if you add all of them together, can certainly throw off those clocks. So that's why this kind of do nothing method becomes really important. So even if you say you um, kept waking up throughout the course of the night, we're going to still aim to get up fairly close to your normal wake up time, plus or minus a little bit of space. You know, we might swing it out a little bit. Um, but largely it's still anchored at around, say, if it's a 6 a.m. wake up time, maybe we go out to, I don't know, 6.40 if it was a really rough night or something. But hopefully we're swinging nearby so that it anchors at around 6 as your consistent time across the board. Um, and then we are avoiding all those other compensating factors that I mentioned. Now, in the short term, that can feel sometimes like cruel and unusual punishment, like how messed up. Um, and of course, there's always case by case, but if you're sick, there's certain asterisks here. But we're talking about in general, um, these are some of the general pieces of uh, wisdom that we find to be really, really crucial to, with Velocity, get ourselves back on track that subsequent night and be able to benefit. And this is another important thing for our psychology to benefit from, hopefully, is to hold on to the knowledge that you are likely to benefit from rebound sleep on that subsequent night after that rough, rough night that you encountered. And even if even if that's still, that next night is still a little funky, maybe you got other things on your plate or whatever, you can almost guarantee that within the next few nights, your body and brain will go after some of that rich sleep that it was deprived of in the past because it is yearning for homeostasis and wants to maintain workability and it's going to do what it can. Um, and it's often when we start uh, kind of freaking out about what might have happened because we see that a lot too with sleep anxiety and, oh no, do I have a problem? Is that old insomnia from years ago coming back? Um, People will then start sometimes taking different medications or stacking certain um, things or elixirs or whatever. Um, and not to say that there's not sometimes a time and a place, but generally what we see is that if you can trust in your body's innate ability to get itself back to where it needs to be without you intervening too much can be really beneficial. Um, and then just the next tactical piece I'll share is um, a couple of things that we would like to still do on top of that maintaining of consistency. So now your alarm's going off at around the same time as usual, but understandably you might be dragging because of that night. Um, then we're aiming to even more than usual really prioritize bright light throughout the course of that day. And I know that I'm sure you've discussed this many a time, but it cannot be underestimated the power of this. And it's going to have this drug-like effect, this phototherapy effect, and turn off any of that lingering melatonin that might be present thanks to the benefits of that bright light. Um, and so we're looking to prioritize that even more than we might normally for that wake promotion and kind of those feel-good cascade of benefits as well. Um, and then we're going to aim to avoid some of the other compensating things that we might go after for many people. Uh, I need to wind down and have a glass of whatever, you know, fill in the blank, wine, yada, um, all those sort of things that maybe we know to do. But if we're on autopilot and thinking that we're trying to support ourselves, sometimes, um, you know, we can step over that fact. I'm so happy that you mentioned the circadian rhythm component because that's exactly what resulted in me not getting the best night's sleep. I ate a little too yeah. late. I got into yeah. bed way later than I typically do. And, you know, life happens. I have a lot of really important, very good decisions to make, but the, it's the timing of those decisions. And I know you do yeah. too, Molly. So even those things uh, through emotions, through conversations with loved ones, just planning and strategizing, putting all the pieces into play, you know, emotions do play into these things. So one of the mm. things I would love to just emphasize is keeping your bedtime consistent. Yeah. I do best when I go to bed at about 10, 30, 11 latest and then wake yeah. up at a consistent time. It's that consistency is so key. And having that two hours before bed, that wind down, reading a book, taking a bath. I always notice the difference if I don't take a bath before bed. There's just something about it that yes. cleansing and just that heat. But I have my room really cold. 
at about yeah. 17 degrees Celsius, which I know you're a huge fan of. So I'm warm totally. after the bath and then I'm naturally cooling down for bed. And that always really helps. But then, you know, sometimes things just get in the way. So if you wake up and you have not the best night's sleep, just it's okay. Like what you said before, you'll have a rebound the next night. Just make sure that the other thing is having really good boundaries around what makes you feel great and lovingly communicating those as well. And uh, this is something interesting, especially in partnerships, because you kind of have to sync up circadian rhythms of of two partners. And that's yeah. also something to consider too. So you have to have, you know, conversations around that with good boundaries and sometimes a little bit of compromise, which is healthy in a relationship. That's a big one. And I always notice a difference if I sleep in my EMF clothing or bedding versus not, or, you know, scrolling on social media versus not reading a book versus not watching, you know, an action packed thriller movie or something really stimulating. Now, those are definitely the things that can impact my sleep, but I am used to getting hundred percent sleep scores. So when I do have that dip down, I really feel it. And I, yeah. like you said before, I don't go into coffee. I'll have the same amount that I, that I have, make sure I'm eating enough protein and also sipping on some homemade bone broth too. That feels really good. And then sitting on my PEMF mat right now, it's very warm. I have the red light therapy going. I actually feel pretty energized to be honest. And then yeah. sitting right in front of a big window, looking at the trees and the sunshine. Love that you mentioned sunshine. And the circadian rhythm clock that we have, just don't underestimate the power of consistency. Consistency is king in so many things. And to not get too extreme, like with lots of things, uh, but consistency with your skincare, with your nighttime routines, with the things that you're doing before sleep. You've all heard me talk about the importance of air purification, water purification, reducing LEDs, shielding yourself from electric fields and wireless cellular radiation. I always notice the difference if I take magnesium before bed or not. I'll, I just feel like I conk out. I like to take that about an hour or two before going to bed. That's a big one. But when you do have those days, you just stay consistent. I think that's fantastic. And what you mentioned about settling with, you know, sometimes people will go for that glass of wine. If I have a glass of wine before bed, my sleep oh, is yeah. terrible. Like I don't even drink commercial Same. wine anymore. Forgot it. Same. Yep. It, isn't it 100%. interesting all these programs that people have? Oh, you know, have a little nightcap. It's like the worst thing you could do for your sleep. The sugar, the alcohol oh, content. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's one of the great things. So for us at Sleep is a Skill, um, so every person we work with is required to wear the Aura Ring. So we've amassed a very large database of Aura Ring users. Um, and as a result, we've gotten to see a lot of what really moves the needle and what is just sort of like a nice idea or, you know, if you want to add it as a chair on top, great. Um, but there's certain things that like really, really make a difference. Um, and of uh, some of the things you're pointing to were fantastic. So one, um, I love that. And I know we talked about this on, on our podcast as well. The bath, the evening ritual of the heat exposure um, contrasted with our cool ambient temperature. So that can make a big, big difference. We had um, eight sleep on the podcast, uh, referencing a number of studies in the domain of thermal regulation. Uh, and one of the things that they pointed to was a kind of uh, protocol that has come out through many, many uh, uh, research papers. And one looking at around one to two hours before bed, at least 10 minutes of heat exposure. Um, and that could look like various things. So for some people, if they say, oh, shoot, I don't have time for a bath. I would love a bath, but I don't have time for it or whatever. Um, then even a, a, wa a warm shower. Um, for some people, and I do see um, bio-individuality on the timing for this, but sauna for different people, sometimes it needs to be a little bit further back if they do have difficulty bringing their heart rate down and other factors in glucose. But um, 
the simple piece is just a little bit of that heat exposure, about 10 minutes exposed, um, one to two hours before bed seems to be helpful in both falling asleep and the quality of that sleep. Um, so that piece is really nice. And then I also love what you pointed to around the partners. So still, um, our most popular podcast episode to date continues to be this one that I'm imagining comes be, uh, just purely from people searching from a keyword, um, SEO perspective of looking at like sleep divorce, um, because this, we had a expert, Dr. Wendy Truxel on the podcast who wrote the book, sharing the covers. Uh, and the whole look was at different research around and, and approaches, um, to sharing the covers, whether that's with our partner, with our kids, with animals, like the whole world of what can go into the bedroom environment and how, um, sometimes our perception of what actually yields desirable results around our sleep can be a little foggy. So some people will say in some of the research that she pointed to, um, oh yeah, I always sleep so much better with my significant other, what have you. And then they look and then they research it and take a actual, um, you know, evaluation of, is that true? And one of the things they see just measurably is it seems to not quite be the case for many people that their, st their sleep isn't as beneficial when they are with their partner, um, just from an aspect of they're moving around for some people snoring and we'd want to address that, but that's a whole other topic. Um, and certain other things that to be aware of. So what her point is, um, rebranding sleep divorce to a sleep alliance in the case for some people that it might make sense for them to be in separate rooms. So say if there's like a shift worker, just totally different schedules, or they're trying to navigate sleep apnea and kind of just very loud snoring or um, certain things with the kids or whatever. So there might be certain periods of time, even if it's a temporary piece, that that could make sense. Um, but then for those of us who do like to sleep with our partner, I've, you know, my husband and I have been together 13 something years. Um, and I, I also have that knowledge of the, the psychological aspect of the partnership piece and the, you know, the comfort and the safety of being with your other person. Um, so it does absolutely depend on the, the couple and the dynamic. Um, but if you're gonna, if you are going to sleep together, then making sure that we're having strong communication and workability, and maybe there are certain systems that get developed, um, and maybe conversations that need to be had if there's certain things that are keeping other people up. So that's a big one too, and it's surprising what a big difference that can make because actually pets um, consistently end up ranking as one of the more frequent interrupters of sleep, even over kids, often because of the length of time, like at least kids grow out of their disrupting of sleep, but often pets um, can stand the test of time of being a disruptor. So sometimes it's surprising um, things that might be sabotaging your sleep a little bit. I'm so glad that you mentioned eight sleep, snoring, sleep alliance, yes. and pets. I actually did a one-on-one -on -one consultation for a lovely lady, Sarah, the other day. And she was sharing that she sleeps, you know, her dog's in the bed or on the ground. I can't quite recall, but the dog gets up, has to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And I was like, oh my yeah. goodness, like you need to train this beautiful animal that you love so much to not do that anymore. Like that, yeah. that's, that's a no go. Like that's going to reduce your life expectancy, your lifespan. It's going to result in, you know, cognitive issues down the line probably. So that's really key. So if you have a pet, they, they need to get out in the middle of the night. You need to train that out of them. And I mean, it's okay if they're senior and it's temporary, you're looking after them. Uh, there's a time and a place for that too. I do really want to emphasize the eight sleep situation. I'm a huge fan mm. of eight sleep. Eight sleep has been on my biohacking page forever. One of the first biohacks I ever did when I was looking at sleep with ordering and eight sleep for monitoring, but I definitely use those EMF, uh, either sheets, covers, or clothing to reduce the Bluetooth that does get kicked off of that. 
but I love it for the temperature regulation, especially for some of you listening who are in menopause and you're experiencing hot yeah. flashes. This is a very real thing that impacts your sleep. So what the eight sleep does is it modulates the temperature of the mattress or mattress cover that you're sleeping on and optimizes the temperature based on your sleep cycle and different sleep stage you're in rather. So really great. And then you can get that temperature regulation optimization on um, your side and then also your partner's side. So that's really key. Snoring, just a couple of little tips here, sleeping on your right side, using those nasal spreaders. Those can really help too. Mouth tape. Um, those are all solutions and love your take on that too. Love the sleep alliance. It's not a that sleep divorce word. It's it's not the highest yeah. word choice. I like the totally. sleep alliance situation. Yeah. And looking at it like a team, always looking at your relationships like you're a team. It's not one person versus the other. Not one person's, you know, importance with their circadian rhythm is more important than the other. It's about compromise and coming up to an alliance and an agreement. But the one thing totally. I really want to touch on is the mom brain before sleep. Men and women are very mm. different. When men's heads hit the pillow, they are out. With moms, it's thinking about the events of the day and a month ago, and that can really start to surface, unfortunately. So journaling, prayer time. I do have a sleep hack that I would like to share. And every yeah. time I do this specific sleep meditation, I am out and I actually wake up feeling so incredibly rested. And it's actually a, a meditation that's that's utilizing different protection strategies. So that kind of stuff I go a little bit more into in the membership with some of the behind the scenes energetic spiritual meditation type of things that I'm just not going to talk about publicly. But with doing everything else, air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, you know, having that heat in the PM, having the magnesium, having a high protein dinner, not too close before bedtime. That is one sleep hack that really makes a difference for me, as well as drinking a ton of water. I'll, I'll have probably about three quarters of a liter of water before I go to bed. And I know most people can't do that because they'll have to get up and go to the bathroom, but I just always wake up so much better when I'm hydrated. I feel like it's just helping with flushing toxins out from my brain. So I would love your feedback on that. Yes. I know on our podcast, you had pointed to that too. And I think, um, so sometimes hydration timing can get a bad rap, I believe in that, um, many people, one of the most common reasons people come our way is because they say, I'm so annoyed about the amount of times I'm waking up to go pee at night. So they begin with that and end, but what's really important is that sometimes, and there are times where, you know, we check out, is there anything going on physically as to why that might be? And, you know, sometimes there is that, but often it's a misattribution error where we believe that it's the needing to go pee that's waking us up. And yet often what's really underneath as we dig is other reasons that we're waking up. And then because you haven't gone to the bathroom in hours because you've been asleep, then usually you could go to the bathroom. Yeah. Now that you're up, actually I could go to the bathroom. Um, and so when we are finding ourselves in that situation where you're waking up a bunch of times, three, four, five in the morning, and you're having to go pee and you're questioning the need to go pee part, instead, I would encourage people to look at some other areas. So most commonly, the place we always start is with sleep testing. So, and I am of the belief that every person should be tested not once but multiple times throughout their lives the same way we would never uh with important vital signs we would never just you know take your blood pressure one time and make all kinds of recommendations about how to function and adjust those and take care of that you would check you know check it dynamically multiple times we don't do that for some reason with our sleep it's very bizarre and um and now we can actually test more and more affordably. So in the United States, we can get at-home tests for around like 160 or so bucks, you know, so always, almost always now um, under 200, certainly. And it will arrive right at your home, easy breezy to, to take. 
but the amount of people. So estimates are anywhere from 80 to 90% of sleep disorders are go undiagnosed. And there's over a hundred, by the way. Um, so there's over a hundred sleep wake disorders and many people have no idea that they are dealing with them. And I think there's a false avatar of what the person looks like that has say sleep apnea, for example, a very common one I see all the time. And we might think that it's men, overweight, snoring, big neck, uh, belly, all these things, right? We might think this, but it's really incorrect. And the number of people that I'm seeing, including women, slender, fit, et cetera, that now as we test them, they either have upper air resistance syndrome or sleep apnea or other things, bruxum, so teeth grinding, um, then it can even get into the domain of other sleep disorders beyond uh, respiratory based. So then we common, commonly can see restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement disorder. So a lot of things that if you've got all that going on and you don't even know about it, I mean, good luck waking up feeling rested and bringing radiance when people are just not getting that crucial time. And there's a lot of also speculations on, well, why are so many people having these sleep disorders? Why does it seem like the numbers are going up? There's a lot of theories, but at least knowing, let's know what we're dealing with. Um, so we always have people start with that testing first. Um, and then we go through and depending on if that is the case, which very commonly people surprisingly are dealing with that, especially women that are navigating perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. Um, we start to see women as they're going through menopause and that those various states um, and the shifts in hormonal and those hormonal shifts that they're dealing with. Um, we see them become more one-to-one -one with the likelihood of having sleep apnea as akin to men. So that's a big difference because we tend to have it less frequently when we're younger as compared to men. But as we age, that uh, likelihood goes up. So even if you were tested before when you were younger and you didn't have any sleep apnea, you can develop sleep apnea or other sleep disorders later. It's dynamic. It's not just set. Um, so we really want to make sure we're not stepping over those. And then we can go into other things like our blood sugar stability. That's another really common reason why we might be waking up throughout the course of the night. The temperature piece, which you beautifully pointed to, so important. And I think overlooked, and maybe people might hear this and say, oh, come on, do you really need to do all this fancy stuff to sleep? Do we need thousands of dollars worth of an investment to sleep well? Well, I would argue that oddly, even though it sounds counterintuitive, that these cooling mattress toppers are closer to how we would have slept in nature for thousands of years because we're, our understanding is we would have slept on the ground or close to the ground, which would have been the coolest place in the environment. Um, and that is almost acting as its natural kind of cooling mattress topper, whereas how we're sleeping in modernity is very weird. Like we would not have in the past been on faux mattresses like some people are and then covered in these big duvets and we're and like cooking like rotisserie chicken in that kind of concoction or that environment all night long and then surprised if we are waking up throughout the course of the night when we're overheating so there's a lot to it um but i think to drink bring it back to what you were saying about the hydration piece we know that the brain is going through this beautiful kind of fireworks of activity while we're sleeping and requires proper hydration for that electrical activity. We know for any sort of um, electric currents to be able to um, actually conduct themselves well, they need proper agents of conduction. Um, so we do need that hydration to support that. So I would be more concerned with dehydration for most people. And that's one of the easiest ways to tank your HRV as well is to be um, chronically dehydrated like we see a lot of. Yeah, thanks so much for adding to that. Do such a wealth of knowledge. I right back at love, you. <laughs> yeah, you're just such an expert in this field and you just explain things so eloquently. Thank you. Oh. I would love to hear your take on this term glymphatics. Tell yeah. us, I, I know... Yeah, I've talked about the lymphatic system and how it's responsible for carrying micronutrients. It's part of our immune system. I teach in my tutorials how to actually move the lymph in 
the head and neck area because when we exercise, we're moving it around in our bodies, but we have to actually mechanically do that on the face and neck. But what's glymphatic drainage and how can sleep actually support it? So good. Well, um, one, I think it's important to realize that this is still a relatively new understanding for us. So it was discovered in around 2012, this um, area of glymphatic drainage and glymphatic with a G versus lymphatic with an L as you're, you know, pointing to those distinctions. Um, it's really, really fascinating because both really important pieces um, or systems in the body and this glymphatic piece um, connected from a perspective and really shining during sleep and particularly during what appears to be largely the first half of our night, uh, which goes to the wisdom of what you were sharing around the consistent kind of wind down time and not consistently lobbing off that first half of our night because one of the things that we see is because consistency of sleep timing is so crucial, um, we might think that, well, as long as we just, even if it's later, we are, you know, so long as we get the prerequisite seven to nine hours, but we just move around the window, what's the big deal? Well, it turns out that say we push it out a little bit on a particular night, what tends to happen is a cutting off of that deep sleep opportunity because the body still tries to keep us somewhat on time, almost, you know, keeping that clock aligned. And if we're cutting off consistently and going to bed a bit too late, then we are cutting into some of that deep sleep opportunity where a lot of that glymphatic drainage seems to shine. So more about that glymphatic drainage, um, it appears to largely be some of this cleansing opportunity for the brain, which is so fascinating where the brain really shrinks in its mass during this time to allow for this fluid to flush through, kind of super soaking the brain and then carrying off and whisking away all of that kind of built up um, toxins and waste that have been accumulating just throughout the course of the day by proxy of just all the things that we got to do and the, all the things that the brain is responsible for. Um, and so how amazing that we take out the trash each night to bring that and send that off and get that out of the brain system. Now, what seems to happen and then one of the reasons this has gotten so much press is that um, it appears that there is this correlation between a lack of consistent glymphatic drainage and what could be some of this buildup of this amyloid beta plaque. And people have probably heard that in relationship to some of these neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's. Um, and it so if there is that correlation, this became big news because for so many individuals staving off neurodegenerative Generative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera, um, had always been like, well, I hope I don't get it, or I hope it doesn't run in the family, um, or, you know, certain things. And of course, in our kind of biohacker space, there'd be other, a little bit other modalities that we'd be aiming to bring in. But for many people, it would feel like just, well, we'll see what turns out as I age, and hopefully that's not me. But if we have, if this um, information is accurate and this correlation, could be related to possible causation, there's still questions, but um, then a practice that each and every one of us can do decades in advance of when some of these things might show up is prioritizing our sleep. And now that's on the long term, but we could anticipate that there could be that cognitive impairment to a certain extent, um, you know, just in a light manner when we talk about oh, brain fog or my memory's going or some of these things casually that we might refer to, particularly after a stretch of time where we haven't gotten our prerequisite amount of sleep. Um, so it's just a really important thing for us to be aware of. And there's got to be almost just from a theoretical standpoint, a why that deep sleep is prioritized first in the night. Um, and so there's lots of theories on the, what is the reason for the order of our sleep and the staging of it. But we can imagine that if that tends to be one of the first things that the brain and body goes after, that it's probably got to be pretty important. Thank you so much for that excellent explanation on the glymphatics and the detoxification of the brain that occurs while we sleep. Now, why this is related to the skin is the skin and yeah. the brain actually come from the same cell line. So if your brain is off, you're experiencing brain fog, you're having difficulty with recall, being present, you're overly distracted. I mean, there's so many things that can play into that, your personality 
personality archetype, your attachment styles, the status of your nervous system and the amount of nervous system dysregulation. I mean, this all plays in part and the skin and the brain are very connected and we want to live our most beautiful lives. We want to look beautiful, but we also desire to function well, like what you mentioned when we first opened up this episode on our operating systems and our programs. So we really do need to prioritize sleep. It's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And for those who are looking to go a little bit deeper into the topic of sleep optimization, Molly, you have an excellent resource and I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. Ah, oh, well, thank you so much for, um, you know, kind of creating and connecting the dots for us too, in how these things can lead to, um, this, you know, goal of this radiance that you kind of opened with so crucial and so rare as we were kind of speculating on nowadays, um, and bridging that gap between how something that is relatively free and, uh, you know, just is an area for us to potentially prioritize that can be available to all of us um, uh, as prioritizing sleep for our anti-aging uh, uh, processes. So, so great. Um, and yes, uh, my mission on the planet is to help support as many people as possible, giving them agency with their sleep. I mean, I can tell you um, my whole reason for creating this company came from my own kind of dark night of the soul periods of time when I went through my own period of insomnia and was given sleeping pills during that period. And that was after seeing really close family members go through really rough times, decades of being addicted to things like benzos, so Xanax and Ambien's and Lunestas and all those things. Um, and we know they're not approved for long-term use. And we're seeing what's being kind of labeled as a silent epidemic of so many people finding themselves now um, stuck or feeling stuck of what do I do? How do I can't get off these things? My tolerance is shifting. So um, for me, I feel like I dodged a bullet because I was able to get myself surrounded by the right people and, um, and research and what have you to get myself on a track where I wasn't having to be dependent on these things, but it could have gone a whole other direction. And so I really don't want to see that for people. Um, and so having said that, I want to give people as many possible resources as, pos as I possibly can. So we have our weekly newsletter um, that goes out every Monday for almost six years called Sleep Obsessions. Um, so lots of free information there. We have our weekly uh, podcast uh, with wonderful people like yourself sharing all kinds of different things that might be unexpected for people of like, oh, wait a minute, my ability to glow and look great is also connected to sleep and helping to provide the science on the why for that. Um, so lots of resources there. And then um, if people are looking for additional support, we work with people specifically wearing aura rings right now. Um, so with that, then we offer aura ring audits so we can audit your sleep information, whether it's a couple of weeks or years, um, and then provide things they can do right away. Uh, we have a weekly uh, or we have an eight week long cohort and that next one is starting up at least for the time of this airing June 12th and then we'll have subsequent ones depending on when you're listening to this. Um, and so that is eight weeks long and throughout that we look at really bringing in tons of the latest research around circadian rhythm and trainment. Um, and then lastly, if people are struggling or maybe they are um, just feel like they've got a layered case or they just want additional support, then we do have one-on-one -on -one options as well. And all of that is available at sleepisaskill.com. Exactly. And then sleepisaskill.com forward slash optimize is getting you access into that uh, group cohort that Molly Eastman was talking about. And for sleep optimization, really, Molly is who I turn to. I've seen you present live many times. I love your energy. I love the way you show up. You're so happy and warm and just always have such a great smile on your face. And, you know, I know that we probably both sleep pretty well. I mean, for the most part, aside from last night, because I went to sleep way yes, too late. Oh, and uh, we all know, got I, those I tales, totally. <laughs> right. But, but this is so key. And just one of the things I want to end on is to be really particular who you are getting 
lifestyle information from, which shows you're mm-hmm. listening to, really look at you know people who are showing up and sharing information. Take a close look at their eyes. What are their eyes telling you? Are they here mm. to be of service or are they kind of in it for the money? And we, we do, I do run into that occasionally, unfortunately. And, yes. and Molly is not one of those people. And uh, that's probably why you get those rock solid sleep scores. I do too, usually. Um, <laughs> we sleep well in it because we're here to be of service and help you on your journey of looking and feeling your best. And mm. Molly Eastman is definitely the go-to sleep resource, in my opinion, Uh, based on the data, the metrics, the biometrics that you gather and analyze how many years you've been doing this. You just set something great up to support individuals. So thank you so much, Molly, for the work that you're doing. Thanks everybody for joining us here on this episode of the School of Radiance podcast. Be sure to share this episode with a friend or family member, subscribe to the show, and you can follow Molly and I on Instagram and everywhere else, just look up our names, Molly Eastman, Rachel Varga official, and we're here to support you. So many blessings to all of you. Have a beautiful high vibe, radiant rest of your day. And tonight, have a beautiful sleep, set the stage. And just if you, if you have those nights where you just don't have the best sleep, it's okay. Like what Molly said, you can make up for it the next night. Not a big deal. Don't beat yourself up. Just don't go to other things to get you through. Just stick with your regular routine. Keep the protein up. Don't go to the alcohol. Stay well hydrated. Love magnesium before bed. The list goes on. So thanks everyone for joining us here. And be sure to learn more about the ways that I can support you on your skin and rejuvenation and radiance cultivation journey through one-on-ones, skincare tutorial, and of course the deep dive membership, the cherry on top the deep stuff I don't talk about publicly that's pretty darn important and that's all available (laughs) over at theschoolofradiance.com and we will see you all next time right here on the school of radiance podcast thanks so much molly for joining us here today thank you so much for having me so appreciate it